two nights in a row. And I understand that probably the ones that did it don't know what we do there, but uh, we're grateful for you guys. Uh, I know a lot of your staff who uh, worked alongside us in some of the neighborhoods we go to. And uh, I know it's a tough and tight spot you're in, but know that we're praying for you and praying for our city and praying for justice. And uh, if we believe in law and justice and order, then we have to believe it on both sides of the coin, not just on one side. So whatever we can do to help you, we're there to help you. And I hope you get all the support you need from the state if you need help. And uh, it's grateful for you and your heart for this city. Thank you, sir. Um, what do we have next? We have a question from Mr. Hawking about do we need to intervene? Okay. And he just asked it up here. Is there the ability to do anything to community? Okay. Uh, one of the questions I have received is from Mr. Dawkins about duty to intervene. Um, and again, how much time do we have? Because it's about 30 minutes. 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Uh, okay. That's not going to work for me. So I have uh, I have more than that. I have about an hour that I'm going to dedicate. Everybody else will just have to wait. Duty to intervene. We have a lot of work that we've been doing, Mr. Dawkins, as you're aware, um, and a little bit have been has been at the tip of the spear. Uh, and and sir, you've been holding that spear, and I appreciate it. Uh, Intervention is a, a conversation we've been having for quite a while. We have our attorneys who have been involved. We have uh, engaged the Citizens Review Board. And uh, right now we're in the process, and I have given our people 48 hours to speak directly to what that intervention can look like for us. Um, I see it as neglect. I see it as conduct unbecoming. Uh, that's fine, but specifically, I want to talk about, based on what we've seen in Minneapolis, this um, this failure to act. Um, uh, we'll talk about intervene more, but failure to act is what I saw. Just the failure to do what is right from a human being. Uh, those um, who stand around and allow something like that to happen are in the wrong profession. We got to codify that in a policy, though, that our officers understand and that the public can understand. And, uh, and better see specifically what we're trying to do and accomplish. Again, 48 hours in that. Chief, I have a question from Cindy Decker. What have you done with the use of force policy since 2016? Use of force policy. We don't have a use of force policy. Now we call it a response to resistance. The essence of it is this. It is illegal for any officer to touch you, to use any force whatsoever without there being a resistance to a legal action by the officer. So I want to get the sequence right. Uh, response to resistance is our policy, meaning if there is no res resistance, there can be no force. We also stress in the updated policy that we just finished uh, last few, in the last few months, um, sanctity of human life and uh, how we value that. Uh, we know that a community has to um, dictate how they're going to be policed. This has been a labor of love. We've been dealing with this. We engage a lot of people. 
lot of the agencies and organizations here locally to do that work. It wasn't done in a vacuum. And uh, the other piece is this can't be just done to the officers. We have to do it with them so we engage them also. And uh, just to explain the core value of this organization around the sanctity of life, and that um, led to a conversation with Safe Coalition, NC, with NAACP, um, External Advisory, a lot of other people, including the uh, Citizens Review Board, to um, get a policy that works for us today. Uh, we are transitioning, we're learning, we're becoming better, and I think that's the result of this journey. And Chief, how can the community help in that regard? How can the community help in that regard? First of all, go online and read it. Um, understand where we're coming from. So you got to understand exactly what we're telling our people and expecting of our people so you can help us hold our people to that standard. Um, and again, uh, the other piece of it is understanding the process. Uh, we have an officer, let's just say, theoretically, we have an officer who uh, violates our policy. Um, to the degree that I think this person should not be a police officer any longer. Um, I need your help in helping the uh, civil service who are volunteers who are appointed by the uh, council and the city manager to understand um, we do have a standard that we expect our people to uphold and when they don't, they need to be held accountable. I can't fire them. I can cite them for termination to that civil service board and those are people just like you who represent the city who you probably don't even know, but who you need to hold accountable. Chief, can you please define resistance? What does that look like? From what we saw in Minnesota, the late George Floyd was not resisting. Um, I absolutely agree. Resistance is failing to cooperate with the legal order or command. That can come in many ways, um, from just not physically moving when you're told to, and it's a legal request, all the way up to fighting uh, and actively resisting and trying to injure uh, the officer. So resistance is failing to um, heed and, uh, and cooperate with the legal order. Um, yes, that, that video that we all saw that is hard to stomach, that um, is disgusting and uh, in a criminal act, uh, that is not action that's used to overcome resistance. I saw no resistance. Uh, when, when we get you handcuffed on the ground and cooperating, um, there is no justification for force. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers your question around resistance and gives you a specific example in relation to the case we talked about. All Chief, right? what happens though if the person resists because they feel they're being wrongfully arrested? Right. If you feel you're wrongfully arrested. Here's the thing. Um, you cannot legally resist a lawful arrest. A lawful arrest. All right. The problem is that that can uh, cause other consequences. Um, we have to have uh, probable cause to believe that you've committed a crime. Time to really get into the nuances of that definition is not when you're encountering an officer. Um, I tell people cooperate um, because you need to have your day in court. Also, if you feel like you're being um, uh, mistreated and this is not justified, you need to call for a supervisor. Somebody who's at a higher level of authority that we can hold accountable, who we expect to lead and be more uh, reasonable and less emotional if that case, if that uh, situation is becoming contentious, to come in and weigh in as an objective party. But the other thing is, if you've been mistreated, if they, if you are arrested and you feel it's unjustified, you feel that some way your rights have been violated or something else, you need to complain to our Internal Affairs Division. That bureau will fully investigate and uh, make sure that our people are in line. If I don't know about it, I can't do anything about it. So you got to make us aware. Chief, what are the long-term goals to address systemic racism in CMPD? Okay, <laughs> we only have 30 minutes. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, implicit bias. I think we lead the nation in some of the education we're doing. It's not training. I can give you check the box training and I can't touch what's in your heart. We wanna be better than that. We've been at that for uh, five years now. Uh, we have uh, an initial uh, primer to it we have a two-day uh, deep dive into it, and then we have a year-long 
journey of education about understanding implicit bias, understanding bigotry, understanding what racism is and what it means to us as black people in particular, people of color in this country, uh, acknowledging and, and knowing your history and learning from it. Uh, it's a journey though. Uh, and what we're doing is trying to vet people on the front end. We have behavioral interviews that speak to this. We wanna make sure you have had contact and engagements and, and work with people different who look different uh, have a different culture than you prior to us hiring you so you can actually do the work we need you to do here in Charlotte. Then when you get here, we have the training that I talked about, but also there's a constant assessment of your behavior. We were one of six pilot agencies that looked at an early warning system with the University of Chicago that looks at big data, how many use of forces you've been in, how um, many um, uh, charges you have of a different type like uh, resist and arrest. We see those as, and, and also, most importantly, courtesy complaints. What we see is those patterns show people who are problematic, who need intervention, so that we can change their behavior or we can root them out of this, out of this agency, um, better yet, this, this profession. So we have a lot of layers there that try to speak to that to get to the core. Here's what I tell you. I believe parents make good character in people we want to hire people who would get character and make them cops. That's just our overall approach. But I've touched on some of the ways we try to ca capture that. Chief, what can Latino leaders in the community do to help? Latino leaders can do a lot, one of which bring us more uh, Latino candidates to join our, our ranks. The other thing, though, is um, we have what we call um, Cops and Kids Learning Spanish. We have a lot of outreach to the Latinos, to the Latino media. You got to get to know us. This is not just for Latinos. This is for everybody, but Latinos and, uh, and Blacks in particular. If you don't know by first name, and even by phone number of an officer in your community, you guys aren't helping us community police your neighborhood. If you don't have that intimate relationship, and that's what we want you to establish. Everybody wants to talk to me about what we do to community police to be better as, as cops. You need to be telling that to the people who serve you and getting to know them on a personal level. That to me too speaks to this accountability. I had um, a community person tell me uh, on Friday that when things go wrong and they see something that didn't look, look right, they call officer such and such and they called him by his first name. Officer Doug comes in, he explains the situation. He knows what is wrong and what is right and he can coach this community member into doing right. You got to truly live in a community policing environment. And that starts with you reaching out to us, getting to, getting to know us deeply, and getting to understand what we do so that you can then truly hold us accountable. Um, you can't hide if there's no anonymity. Chief, how do I find the officers in my neighborhood and who they are? Very good question. Um, scary because that shouldn't be a question that anybody here is asking. Go to our website. You can see geographically what your region is, where you live, your district. There's a captain there that you need to send an email and make a phone call to. Um, they will arrange for you to meet with officers who patrol your areas. Uh, also, you got to get involved. You got to come to some of the community meetings. They're all over every division, all over this jurisdiction, all over the city. Uh, you step to us, we'll run to you. Um, but it's got to go both ways. It's community and policing. As a community member, uh, you should be obligated to uh, make sure you know who's policing you so you can hold them accountable to, to do it in a way that you uh, find acceptable. So reach out to that division, talk to that captain, tell them you want to meet some of the cops who are out here policing and you want to make sure they're doing it the way you expect them to. They need to hear it directly from you. Back on the Floyd situation, sir, the officer who killed Mr. Floyd had several charges, but was hired anyway, according to this community member. What are the screening tools you have in place for officers? Okay, um, I want you to go to our website too and look at the uh, hiring process. But um, we, it's a battery of tests, some of which are state mandated, uh, meaning your criminal history, uh, your driving record. Other things are a bit more, I think, substantive. We look at your work history. Uh, we interview you. Uh, there's a battery of interviews that you have to face. We want to get to know the kind of person that you are so that we can see if you fit the kind of person who should be policing in our jurisdiction. 
So we have uh, personality assessments. We have a lot of things that we do. We have behavioral interviews. And also, we're going to see your track record. We want to see how you've been living your life, making sure that uh, you live your life in a way that you have a broad contact with a diversity of people. and You're comfortable within that range. Because if not, you're not ready to do the work here that we need you to do to properly police our, our city. What is your relationship, Chief, with our neighboring counties and partners such as Union County, et cetera? And how do we manage that relationship? Great relationship. We talk uh, often and uh, right now, um, <laughs> virtually uh, every day, um, we train together. Um, Gaston County in particular, we know exactly how to um, reach out and uh, our a lot of our work, especially in the area of tactics, are things. So we constantly, we, we're a regional city. So it, it would be um, it would be insane if we didn't engage those partners in establishing and maintain them who are right here in this region. So it's very strong and um, uh, we're not all the same, meaning we don't have all the same policies, but we do discuss and debate them so that we can all improve. It's a very strong relationship. Questioning from Arcadius Armstrong, sir. When officers have multiple complaints on them and they're still given the privilege to patrol those certain areas, do they stay on that same assignment or are they moved around the city to different assignments? It depends. Um, again, though, let me just say this. If we see somebody who shouldn't be doing this work because they have a consistent, repetitive behavioral issue, we don't want them in this work. Um, however, um, just like anybody else, you have to learn uh, from some mistakes. Um, as long as they're not mistakes of abuse, mistakes that be rectified, we give you the opportunity to correct your behavior and we keep moving. I'm not going to move you around because community policing is people in that neighborhood need to know you. You need to know them. There needs to be a personal connection so that there's not this anonymity. I can tell you um, just uh, my two cents. And since y'all logged in, I guess you wanted to hear that. Um, the issue out in Minneapolis, uh, you when there's a distance and an anonymity, there's a lack of humanity. And that flies in the face of community policing. So if you don't know the officers in your neighborhood, we're just not getting it quite right. Chief, is there an actual sophisticated racism test in the hiring process? Racism test, there's a, a bigotry test and, um, and there's a bias test. And I talked about the vetting process, also about the behavioral interviews. Uh, here's the deal. Um, if I'm a racist, I'm not going to tell you. So we look at your behavior. We look at your associations. We look at your social media. Um, if you're not going to share those types of things, we're not going to hire you. We want to see what kind of person you are. And um, I can tell you, uh, biases and bigotry go in a lot of forms, races, but one. We want to root out all of them because if you're not of good character, you're not the caliber of person that we want. We're not perfect. Um, I can tell you, I, I, I submit to you, if there's somebody in this organization that believes uh, the way in which Mr. George Floyd lost his life is okay or you can rationalize it, they're not cut out to be cops here. And what we do is we, we give you scenarios to try to tease that out. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work that we do. We don't have a racism test, but we do have a, a, a lot of... Um, assessments around biases and bigotry. How can we join or engage the civil service or the citizens? You vote for elected officials who represent and appoint these people. Um, I keep talking about a report card for, listen, uh, I got about 59 more working days and I'm gonna have a lot of report cards that are gonna be fed to you for me personally as a citizen of Charlotte because the issue is there are a lot of people who talk about accountability who don't, can't even really define it. They know they want us to be accountable when something goes wrong. But what about the people behind the scenes who get to really overrule my decisions who you don't even know? If I say somebody needs to be fired because they're not cut out for this work that I've been doing for three decades in this organization that I love, um, I, I think it's not personal, it's professional. And I need some support in that. So when you see me cite somebody for termination, uh, based on something that's going on, and then you hear that they are back on the job, um, you should ask questions. The problem, too, is these hearings are closed to the public. 
that is a law that you should be attacking. Uh, some states allow for discipline and misbehavior to be publicized. Um, if I've done something wrong and jeopardized the trust that you have in me as an officer, you should know about it. Um, the laws in North Carolina um, don't allow for that. I want to protect our people, give them due process, but there has to be accountability at the, at the state level with laws that you need to be educating yourself on. And we can have more conversation about what that could look like as well. Chief, again, back on the protest situations, is there any evidence that outsiders, quote unquote, outsiders are instigating this type of behavior that's taking place in Charlotte? Okay, let me tell you this. Uh, I'm tired of that question. Uh, I am. Uh, the, the, uh, who cares? Um, the, the, the deal is, we got people who are hurting and mad, and I understand that. Uh, sorry, I'm mad too. Um, but uh, what I see is us trying to excuse what we're dealing with here. Um, I can tell you this. Uh, the first night, everybody arrested was from North Carolina. All but about three were from this region. Uh, one was from Asheville, one was from Swansboro. Um, but here's the deal. Last night, we had about a third of them maybe who were from, quote unquote, outside of the state. But who's to say they weren't visiting people who saw this video while they're here visiting and got mad and wanted to do something about it? Um, and I'll tell you this, too. Here's the deal. We keep talking about peaceful protests. I want to talk about lawful protests um, because I think peaceful pro protests is, is kind of dismissive. It's a standard that I don't even think I could reach if I weren't uh, sworn to do what I have to do here. Um, I'm not asking for um, somebody to be totally docile in the way they protest. I am uh, expecting that we be lawful. Uh, peaceful protests, uh, I, you know, my people here in my um, organization are tired of hearing me say it. Peaceful, peaceful protests were tried and uh, proved quite successful in the 50s and 60s. Um, but if you read even Dr. Martin Luther King's later writings in the last year and a half of his life before he was assassinated, um, you will hear that um, more and more people are willing to accept protests that are not as peaceful. So what we want is to be people to be lawful. And here's the other thing. Uh, we can't discern, quote unquote, good from quote unquote bad. All we know is those who are violating the law, and, and, and when we tell you legally you have to disperse, everybody who doesn't is breaking the law. So we have peaceful protests, we have lawful protests that can get contentious, and then we have um, riots and, and violations of law. I just say we got to be careful in how we define it. Here's what I'll tell you, too. Um, when we talk about, I got questions about why do we wear riot gear and uh, because we're in the midst of, a, midst of a riot and it protects our people. Um, peaceful protests, you see our uh, constructive conversation, people talking to you. We're not in those riot, in riot gear. We don't need to be. We don't need to be in civil emergency uniforms. Our bike officers aren't either. When it starts to escalate and it moves from peaceful to lawful but um, uh, very aggressive, even in tone and language, and we expect and anticipate there could be violence, we then back those people out, the officers on bikes and soft clothes, and bring in our civil emergency unit because they're protected. And then uh, if we're assaulted and pelted with rocks, obviously we uh, give dispersal orders and expect people to leave. That's kind of how that, that proceeds. Chief, can you speak to the issue of these outside groups again, yes. just in the sense of this current crisis? How do we discern these outside groups from locals, right. and how do we work with them to de-escalate? All right, so um, we, well, like I just told you, when it's when it's peaceful and it's, and it's conversational, people are actually coming to be heard and to hear and to hear explanation. We engage in conversations. Um, we ask you, hey, so where are you from? Are you a charlatan? What, we ask those kinds of questions. But the, the data that we get, though, is those who violate the law, those who are arrested, and I can tell you that. I wish it were just outsiders and we here in pristine Charlotte don't don't um, resort to violence. That hasn't been the case in the majority of these arrests and these issues. So I can't tell you all people are agitators from the outside. I can tell you though, this is pretty coordinated across the country. It is intentional. 
Um, I can tell you that we go from lawful protests, which we see during the day, to a different element who's more violent and intent on um, assaulting our officers and destroying property at night. Uh, they're younger, they're more aggressive, much more energetic, and uh, even willing to resort to violence. So um, the excuse of the South Side agitators is wearing thin with me because um, we here, though, locally need to be speaking out, pointing them out so that we can strategically take those agitators out of the uh, lawful protest so that it can continue to go on lawfully and without violence. Back on Floyd, sir, how would you describe the police chief's demonstration of respect for George Floyd's family? Um, I don't know. I, I, I can tell you um, anytime there's a in custody death or an awesome ball shooting, there's a fatality here. I reach out and give my condolences. Uh, and I tell you, it's not empty words, but it's beginning to feel that way because um, there's a lot, a lot, a life lost. And I get that. It's, it's a tragedy, but I, I can't speak to what uh, the other chief's done. I hadn't, haven't really uh, seen what that chief has done uh, relative to the Floyd family. I know, um, did pray for his family and wish them the best. And I hope something positive can come from this. We only engage in these conversations when it goes far, far left and, and, and tragic. Our work continues and people are going, Chief, what are you doing to hold people accountable? What are you doing to engage with your community? I have a pamphlet here that we put on everything. And uh, can you see it? Am I holding it up? There we go. For, for everybody to see. This initiatives and programs that we've been doing, one of which is taking people from having issues through Envision Academy, we have opportunities for employment and, and even education in the college. We're doing a lot of work that people aren't informing themselves of because they're looking at us through a prism of um, negativity that has been haunting this profession for a while. I'll say if you don't give us a chance, we can never make change, but we got to make change together. Chief, I have an uptown business owner who's asking about crisis trained officers in the community. And do you feel more crisis or CIT trained officers would be helpful in the community to help citizens out more? Yes. That's why we asked for money and were granted uh, $2 million to train people in advanced first aid um, and in crisis intervention training. Uh, also, uh, we were one of the first in the country to implement what I call the community policing crisis response team to proactively go out to people who are in crisis to prevent a negative encounter with the police um, before it can even start. We're doing a lot of work there. Yes, we're, we're constantly trying to get more trained right now because we're in the midst of a pandemic that everybody seems to have forgotten about. Um, we can't have more trained right now because it is a, a in-person training that they can do 40 officers at a time. My goal is to have all of our people trained, but it's going to take us a while to get so. A, recruit, a recruitment question, sir. What does active recruitment oh. in the black neighborhoods, poor black communities look like? Yeah, I think what does it also look like in the Latino community as well? Sure. Um, uh, well, the, it goes back to the philosophy of community policing. We're out there uh, trying to engage people, get to know people, and to actually actively recruit people. We want to model the behavior we want to see and that you want to see in your community and your community police officers. And then we want to try to entice people into this work. We spend a lot of money advertising in a lot of ways, but really it's the face-to-face -face contacts that we're making. We talk about hundreds of thousands of those contacts every year. That's the biggest piece of recruitment. The other thing is we do it through social media and gaming because that's where most of the young people spend a lot of their time. And uh, we flood them with the opportunity, and it's all races, but in particular for, for blacks and Latinos that we want to see more of coming to this profession. Question, sir, on Councilmember Winston's arrest. When we saw Councilmember Winston arrested, it seemed like officers violently took him to the ground. Is that show of force necessary, and is there a policy? Yes, there's a policy, absolutely. And, and here's the thing you got to understand, and I'm going to say this very slowly. Um, when we see uh, that our officers have been receiving and hear th from them that they're receiving rocks and bricks and bottles, they're being assaulted. It is transitioned from a protest to a riot. And at that point, we give orders to disperse. We tell people you need to leave or we're going to have to release chemical munitions. And when you don't, um, we do what we say we're going to do. Uh, what I, uh, and I'm not going to talk about any specific case, but what I can tell you is um, your mere refusal to leave 
And truthfully, um, we don't know who you are. Um, many of us don't. But when you refuse to leave, uh, our, our, our tactical way of doing it is our arrest team comes out, takes you in. Sometimes we'll prone you out to get you handcuffed and uh, because it's the safest way to do so. Uh, no one was injured in that arrest. Um, it does look violent because we have to assertively go into an area that can be dangerous to extract people who can also be dangerous. That's the philosophy. I can't get into specifics of any case because that's what the court of law is going to determine when everything's said and done. A follow-up to that, sir. The safest way to do so for whom? For both. The um, person we're arresting who um, was not injured and our officers who were not injured. Switching gears to the RNC, what crisis plans are underway to prepare for the RNC? 22 um, plans just with us as a police department and our partners are underway with subcommittees from a range of everything. Uh, tactics that we just talked about all the way to uh, uh, how we're going to protect the area with fencing. So there are a lot of different subcommittees that will work on all, of, um, all kinds of areas of, of um, uh, safety measures that we're taking. And that's been underway for um, about a year and a half, almost two years now. And several people are asking, sir, how can they help and make a difference? We have ambassadors asking, faith leaders are asking, what is your call to action from them to get engaged and, and make a difference here? It's pretty simple. Um, make sure you have your voice heard. Um, if you want to protest, especially during the daytime, and come out and, and speak with our officers and have them hear directly from you expectations. But let's be strategic. And let's be reasonable about what we want. People say, Chief, we want you to be transparent, yet um, I don't own some of the things that you talk about transparency on. I don't own our officer-involved shootings or in-custody deaths anymore. Those investigations have been taken away, so I can't speak to them. Um, I don't own the final say in whether or not officers can be hired or fired or even promoted. I have to submit them. I'm okay with the uh, hiring and the promotion, uh, but um. Uh, when when people have violated the trust of the community and we can't reestablish it, that we need to part ways with them and having an outside entity. And some of the former members have told me directly, those who talked to me, that uh, their intent was not to get rid of officers because they have families. I've heard that from two different people. I get the family. I get that. But I also get that there's a greater need and a greater calling that we're going to uphold. The vast majority of our people do so well. Those who don't should not be police officers. In addition to prayer, sir, what else do you need from the faith and ministry leaders in their roles? Do you need more chaplains? You know, what do you need, especially as you're preparing for the RNC as well? I want you to show up and model what lawful protest looks like. I want you to show up. If you're mad, be mad. Explain why. So our people, our officers, and I can understand. If you have expectations of what you want to see from us, articulate. Um, I don't care about the volume. But I do care about that we do so without violating the law because that puts lives in danger. So, again, all I want you to do is show up, mean what you say, model the behavior you want the young people to see because the young people who are coming in at night are uh, coming in to commit violence. Um, I think truly it's an offense to memorializing Mr. Floyd because damaging and burning property, um, assaulting, uh, people uh, is not the way to get a message across that uh, we need to improve the police department. We need you to be specific in what you want to do. We need you to model the behavior you want others to follow so that we can continue to get better. We're better today with a response to resistance, not just a use of force policy, because those were articulated expectations that uh, we heard loudly and clearly four years ago. And uh, we continue to make improvements, and that's an example of how it should work. Chief, we have a few questions related to COVID-19. Can you please speak to the executive order as it relates to distancing and size of crowds? And is it possible for you to give permission to participate in protests, even with this executive order in place? I cannot give permission, but uh, the governor has allowed for um, the First Amendment to be exercised as long as there's social distancing. Again, you got to think about the practicality of enforcing that. 
Um, I have an officer now who's charged with going into a crowd that might be hostile, telling you, stick your arms out, let's make sure you're six feet apart. I get the intent, but sometimes the practicality is a challenge. Um, but what we are doing is educating people in the vast majority of people are, are complying with what we're asking of them. And um, right now, my, my concern is uh, community members and our cops are being exposed. If there's a, uh, an outbreak and a significant increase, um, uh, you know, we're going to greatly impact our ability to do our work because right now, uh, those recommendations about social distancing and um, wearing masks and so forth are being violated at a great rate. Uh, we can't arrest our way out of problems. This is a problem that we're going to have to get cooperation on. National Guard, sir. Is the National Guard here? Are they going to help us protect property and businesses? National Guard has always been here. They were here um, uh, most recently for this COVID-19 uh, outbreak and pandemic. Um, so uh, we, it's an administrative process. We wanted to initiate. I'm not going to get flat, caught flat-footed, not able to protect my community, all people who live here, and the property from destruction. They would serve to um, maintain the safety of the infrastructure, buildings, and so forth, while our people engage and deal with the crowd. Yes, that is, they are, they have been activated. That process has begun. Um, the, the, the guard is... Uh, here to respond when necessary. Uh, unfortunately, though, their resources have been stretched across the state because no one here in this state is immune to the protests based on this tragic um, uh, death, murder, manslaughter of Mr. Floyd. Chief, how can we go about starting programs to build relationships between officers and the communities they protect? What should we do if we're interested in doing something like that? You should get involved. You should come to the community meetings. Every uh, community has meetings. Um, and I know you're busy. I know you work. They're once a month. Come once a quarter. But at least get engaged so you know who's policing you. And there's a specific and intentional and personal level of accountability. And, and expectation. You can't establish that from a death. You definitely can't establish it just telling me and then expecting magically I'm going to intimately connect you with cops. It doesn't work that way. There's a little bit of effort on the community's part, but all you have to do is show up, uh, reach out to the captains even and say this is something you want to do and explore. You'll see all the programs and initiatives, some of which might um, uh, uh, you know, be something you're interested in, might pique your interest. Jump in with both feet. We'd love to have your your assistance. Chief, last thing, I, I don't think we have any other questions, although there are some in the thread that have been answered by some folks we already have on the line from community services and so forth. The ambassador program, bridgethedifference.com. If they want to get involved, they can also attend that training, right, Chief? Yes, that really wasn't a question. <laughs> but uh, the whole point of Bridge the Difference is we got to get ready for this Republican National Convention. Uh, what you see now is the pain and hurt from another flashpoint around race and justice. Um, I'm, I don't think these conversations are going to go away. They haven't. Um, they have to be dealt with. And the best way to overcome racism, people talk about the implicit bias study and what it shows out of Harvard. What they don't show is there are some recommendations about how you overcome it. That is connecting with people different than yourself consistently. So you see what you have more in common, which is what we're trying to do with Bridge the Difference, than different. And um, you faith leaders understand sometimes that's faith. Sometimes it's just establishing friendship where people are different than you. I, I, you're going to say I'm oversimplifying it, but I'm really not. If I were, we wouldn't have some of our ambassadors who've gotten to know us standing between a police car that was about to be damaged by a crowd who was angry and the people who were about to assault on that, uh, on that vehicle with our officers. They put themselves in harm's way for our benefit. They inversed what we see policing uh, as being responsible for. Only the way they did that is they knew officers intimately and they connected with us on a human level and, and we love them for it. Another question from Robert Dawkins. We do have a few more coming in. Good. He still wants to hear about those holster monitors and is there a timeline? Signal sidearm is what it's called. And uh, we should be rolling that. We are going to be rolling those out this month in June. So by the end of June, all of our officers in patrol will have those 
that technology. What that does is every time the weapon's drawn, it triggers the body-worn camera, so then we can tape it. I tell everybody, though, you have a smartphone, turn that thing on with any encounter with the police. But for a smartphone, uh, we might not even know what happened tragically to Mr. Floyd. So capture, we want to capture our body-worn, that the city uh, leadership, mayor and city council at the time, uh, invested 7.2 million of your tax dollars into, want to catch them on a body warm, but uh, iPhones uh, work just as well. Chief, back on the RNC, how will CMPD deal with pro-Trump protesters who show up with weapons? Um, we're going to deal with anybody who shows up at a protest with a weapon the same way, uh, pro, uh, against whomever. Um, don't care what your political ideology is, I care about the safety of our citizens. So you're entitled to your First Amendment right, but we have laws in this state that won't allow for that at a, at a protest. Are you adding any citywide community engagement or campaigns with businesses to show support for a united community? One member is saying, I see a lot of community engagement opportunities on your website for youth, low-income neighborhoods, but I think business leaders can be more engaged in supporting a united community. Sure. Um, you might not be aware that some of the programs that you mentioned, Envision Academy actually is paid for and sponsored by local businesses. That gives our youth an opportunity to see all the opportunities in the business sector, in the public sector, in the arts, but also it, it leads to job opportunities. Members of our police foundation who are also helping us sponsor uh, those uh, that in, that Envision Academy of the opportunity also are looking to potentially hire people as interns and then full-time employees as they matriculate through that Envision Academy, graduate high school, and go off to college. So there's a lot of good things the business community is doing. None of those seem to go seem to go virus. I mean, uh, viral because um, they're not uh, as negative and as gut wrenching as the video that we saw but they're still no less important for this community. I totally agree. So we have business opportunities too to engage. That's one of them. There are many others. If you have other ideas, please uh, send us emails so that we can uh, try to make those connections or do so yourself. You make the connection and bring us in. Chief, was there a different approach taken for the protest in South Park today? Can you speak to that? No. Uh, I, there was no difference in the approach. We approach them all the same. We get intelligence as we see what's happening. We try to engage with the leadership. Uh, some are willing to engage with us, others aren't. And then we properly staff and um, educate people on what is lawful. And uh, we allow them to exercise their First Amendment right. And um, if it uh, becomes something that is a violation of law, we deal with it uh, from the legal realm. Uh, that's what we did in, on Betis Ford Road. That's what we're doing on South Park. That's what we do all over the city. Um, our, our strategy doesn't change based on where it is or who we're engaging with. PPE, personal protective equipment. Are officers wearing PPE during this time? Um, officers are wearing uh, gas masks, which provide for even a higher level than just the N95s. So um, as best we can, it's kind of, you, you don't want to put on a, a N95 and a gas mask because they won't be able to breathe, but as best we can. Again, um, the problem is when people are in your face, it's hard to social distance. So we can only control so, so, uh, so much of that, which is why I'm concerned about the health and safety of our officers. But when they don the gas masks, they are protected at the highest possible level. Um, otherwise, they step back, distance themselves, get relief, and... Um, uh, try to practice social distancing as best they can. Kind of hard to do the, when you're in the midst of a riot. We'll give it, you know, a few more seconds to see if there's any more questions right. coming in. I want to tell you this. I appreciate your time. I'm honored um, that you'd spend a little time with me. Um, I wish we could do more of this. Listen, I'm not a virtual kind of person. Uh, those of you who know me, but I, I did think it's very important that you hear directly from me. Uh, my words are always, um, let's just say, um, massaged. So now you hear directly where I'm coming from. You see me for what I am. You hear what I'm saying. I mean every word of it. Um, I, I pray that together we'll demonstrate what lawful protest looks like. Um, and, and I'll ask you too, 
uh, for the safety of the community and our officers. Um, when things become violent, I want you to be safe and go home because I don't want good people to get caught up in a bad situation that you didn't create. I also want us to um, not forget though that we keep having this conversation. Uh, a lot of these initiatives came from similar conversations, so uh, word can lead to work, but we gotta do it together. Um, and I appreciate what, you're, what you stand for, who you are, and now let's make sure we all together protect our city. If you see something and you see someone doing something that they shouldn't be doing because it's gonna escalate a situation, you need to let us know so we can deal with it strategically so that it doesn't uh, elevate into something that we're all, um, we, we can't be proud of. I, I just do see one more question. Where can people find out about those meetings? And I know that they're announced on the website uh, and through social media. And uh, the app that's supposed and to be app. launched yes. here soon so we can push all that information out to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and also you can reach out to, to uh, send an email uh, to me in particular and I can direct it to your, uh, your uh, captain in your respective area. Perfect, sir. I think all that's right. it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Be safe and be blessed. Thank you.